uh, discussion starting. But hello, everybody. Welcome to a new year. Uh, welcome to our December 2022 jobs report and inflation update. Uh, for those of you that are new, each month, this webinar seeks to separate truth from fear, especially with continuing economic volatility, ongoing layoffs, and concern about the future, which is the biggest concern. Uh, my name is Colin. I am a mod and administrator at Albert's List, the San Francisco Bay Area's most active career community featuring over 40K job seekers. Um, and with us today is Dr. Riley White, Associate Dean of Teaching and Learning and Associate Professor of Finance at the University of New Mexico. Among many things, Dr. White is an advisor for the 4.7 million student run UNM Regents portfolio and leader of financial literacy projects in the community. His work and insights have also been published in numerous journals and featured in local and national media outlets. So thank you to everyone for joining us today. And over the next hour, we're gonna discuss uh, the latest CPI updates, uh, jobs reports, inflation, and then you are also invited to ask questions and share your insights anytime in the chat or Q&A section uh, down below. Um, and then we'll read it out and try and address it. Um, Dr. White, over to you. Thank you so much, Colin. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here tonight, and I'm so glad for you taking the time on this magnificent Thursday evening to talk about economics in the world of finance and the world of markets and our economics reports. Again, my name is Riley White. I'm so happy to see you all uh, as you as I go through this presentation and shenanigans uh, and put any questions you have in the chat, and I'm very happy to address them. So I'm going to kind of share a little brief presentation here about stuff, about our December 2022 jobs report, our inflation report, and a little bit of insight towards the 2023 analyses uh, as we kind of go ahead and talk about this. So a couple of things up note too, and I appreciate it as well. So I know my name is Riley White, a finance professor, also associate dean at UNM Anderson. Just out uh, this holiday season, spent some quality time visiting my uh, family in the Bay Area. Uh, very awesome. Nice to see uh, symptomatically traffic uh, once again in a large quantity. It was delightful. Um, just to remind me the, the, that surging economic activity is possible. But anyway, so we have a couple of good things. So uh, first of all, when we talk about our December jobs report, uh, we had another good month. We added about 223,000 jobs. This is actually a very good month considering that we were kind of prognosticating, uh, starting to slow down in a few areas. It was very interesting though. Uh, the market through the holidays was fascinating. On this chart at the right, courtesy of the Economic Policy Institute, um, you can sort of see where we added those jobs. On a whole, unemployment rate dropped to three and a half percent. Now, unemployment rate takes the, excuse me, the number of people who are in the labor force, either looking for a job or have a job, and puts that as the denominator and the number of people who are unemployed looking for a job and unable to find one is in the numerator. Um, it doesn't include things like people who drop out of the labor force. It doesn't include things that, you know, involve people who might leave for one reason or another or people who aren't part of it, people who drop out for disability, people who retire, that kind of stuff. And so, and so to see these numbers, this is really, really interesting. So uh, in this jobs report, we saw 78,000 increase in the education and health sector, of which most of that was health. Education and health is kind of grouped together. Sectors are grouped together for the in the Bureau of Labor Statistics when they have sort of similar um, uh, uh, profiles in terms of when they hire, fire, that kind of thing. So, so we can draw some commonalities. So it's not education per se, most of it's healthcare. Healthcare has been pretty robust lately in the last six months. Now, we've also added 67,000 leisure and hospitality. That's good news. That's the hotels, restaurants, all that stuff. Um, they've always struggled. They were hardest hit by the, by the pandemic. We're still seeing that recovery happen. They still have fewer employees now than they did prior to the 2020 pandemic, but they're doing more with those employees. Um, and we added, interestingly enough, and one of the most appealing parts in this was the 26, 28K, I'm sorry, 28,000 that we added in construction. Construction normally slows down in winter across most of the country. Um, it's kind of enlivening knowing that at least somehow, uh, despite higher rates and higher financing rates, construction is still ongoing. And that's just not looking at cranes in the sky. We're looking at a bunch of residential and commercial projects across the board uh, that have been happening. Now, labor force participation was on a kind of downward slide. That's the percent of people, of course, who are who could be working uh, um, within the population or actually have jobs within our overall population above um, that could potentially be working age. Now, what happens is though, is this measure is kind of imperfect. We reached the maximum amount of uh, participation in this country back in the year 2000 from the 70s, 80s and 90s 
um, you know, we increased participation. We had, of course, baby boomers coming in online, uh, taking jobs. And of course, women entered the workforce in mass. And then, of course, that combination led to us growing participation. Since then, participation rate has been has been going downward. And it trends downward, especially during recessions or difficult economic times as people retire early, they get out of the workforce, they um, or they're or they're fired or they're left out, but then they leave the workforce and don't look for another job. So 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 there's a lot of that. And a lot of that is demographic. And what one of the things that um, Albert alluded to, if you were on uh, right before we began, was he's basically talking about a lot of things and uh, um, and he's looking at a uh, um, you know a, a, a actually a very good observation that because of the demographic profile of the United States, we are getting older. We're going to resemble countries like Japan and South Korea, and as a consequence, uh, we're going to have some. Um, uh, interesting, challenging economic environments ahead, particularly as it results in uh, everything from asset prices to real estate dynamics to other things that will be driven ultimately by demographics. To a certain sense, we can offset that with things like immigration and other things. Whether that will be is a matter of policy, it's a matter of demand and other things uh, uh, that we, we can't anticipate quite yet. But interestingly, our labor force participation rate did go up. Now, we were declining a little bit for the last few months. We had this five month long, four month long um, decline in, in participation rates. This has since bounced back a little bit. It still is lagging a little bit from where we were before the 2020 pandemic, but that's a good sign. It means people are entering the workforce again. They're looking for a job if they don't have one and it's pretty good. Unemployment rate is again, this represents the closest we can get to uh, uh, 50, um, a, um, a 50 year low of our unemployment rate around three and a half percent. So I'm keeping an eye on the on the ongoing conversations around uh, networking and not networking. This is good. So anyway, um, uh, so one thing. This is very exciting. <laughs> There's unemployment rates are low. By the way, hire everyone in the chat window. I like that. I like that philosophy, Scott. Good work. So one of those things. Annualized wage growth. Now, this is very interesting. Wage growth, of course, uh, when we think about wages increasing, wages can power inflation over the long run. They do so because you pay people more money, they spend more money, there's more demand uh, sloshing around for certain goods and services that can increase inflation. Wage growth right now is about 3.4%. For the last few months, we've seen a downward trend in wage growth. Now, to power inflation over the long run, you need not only sufficient increases in, in prices and other things that might be caused by temporal events, but to make long-term wage growth, long-term inflation possible, you need also wage growth to go along with this. And we're not seeing it. So the big bottom line here is that wage growth here, it's depressing in a way because you're like, I want to earn more money. But it's also realistic in some senses that uh, one benefit of this, if you can call it that, is that it's clear that inflation is not being powered in the long run by wage growth. And that is beneficial and it does lean towards um, a, a, a more rapidly declining inflation rate in 2023, which we'll talk about next. So things as well. So overall, very strong employment report. Very pleased with this employment report. I was worried we'd be down in the hundreds. 223,000 jobs is pretty good. Uh, we even saw increases in manufacturing and wholesale trade. Uh, we saw increases, a slight increase in government and things like transportation and warehousing, which has been robust in response to supply chains, also increased. Um, but other things like information, professional and business services, information, of course, being ever so pertinent in the 146,000 odd employees in the Bay Area uh, that work in the information sector. Um, this, is, this has been down somewhat, and that's a bit discouraging. Now, on the other end of this, Oh, this is a really good point too. Albert says, I think continued low labor supply may continue to push wages up since labor force participation hasn't fully recovered and younger generations opt to work versus start families due to austere social safety nets. Absolutely true. Think about that. That's a very interesting and profound statement. We do a very limited uh, relative to, to many countries um, uh, social safety nets and as a consequence, um, when you think about this, you think about the way people delay, the way people think about uh, uh, the benefits of labor supply. And, and it reminds me of a, of a website I frequented back in the day. Let's see if I can find it here. Um, I, it's, uh, it's, it talks about population pyramids. And I want to kind of relate and kind of really want to estimate precisely why it's so important that, that we consider some of what Albert uh, was saying here. Um, <clears throat> 
And so, Aaron, you're right about the question of immigration as a whole. But if I show you a chart, if you're using numbers after 2017, you can see sort of our immigration relative to, to, to the 2017 numbers has since declined and it's declined in a very interesting way. Some of that's very structural. Some of that has to do with things like uh, the nature of the pandemic, the nature of other aspects of the economy, the nature of even wanting to come to the United States. But a lot of that has to do with the sort of labyrinthian um, uh, difficulty it's been to get things like visas and immigration permits and other things across the country. A simplified process would, would, would benefit a lot of people. So I'm going to kind of switch gears here uh, real quick because I like Albert's point so much that I want to elaborate on this a little bit here. And so let me grab, uh-oh, unfortunately I'm clicking the wrong, the wrong things here. I'm going to go to the U.S. The United States Population Pyramid, courtesy of the ever so distinguished uh, um, website. And this, well, I like websites that deliver what they promise, populationpyramid.net. <laughs> it's my, it's delightful. It's easy to use. It's fantastic. Populationpyramid.net. So anyway, what it does is it basically shows the ratio of population of the United States or any other country you pick actually. Um, and uh, it's a very unique site. I hope if maybe one of the developers is in the audience right now, I've appreciated this. I've showed this to my classes. It's delightful. But when we think about this, the United States of America, population 329 million, you're going to have, um, uh, uh, and this is back in 2019, so it's slightly below uh, today's dates, you have this sort of overall population pyramid. At the top, you have people over 100, not a lot. And at the bottom, you have people who are very young. So entering retirement, you have this kind of bubble of people here, this bubble of people in their 60s and 50s who, who these formed the, that baby boomer generation. And then we had kind of that mini boomer generation, um, people born in the 80s and 90s, the children of the boomers that, are, that entered the workforce in mass. And so we have that benefit. And then we have sort of a, a drop off here. Now, if we went back in time a little bit here and I went back to, I don't know, how far back do I want to go? Maybe if I went back to 1960 in the United States, we looked a lot like, say, a developing country does now uh, across the world. We had a very population pyramid that was very skewed towards the bottom. We had a lot of babies, a lot of youth. That powered the economy in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And we go ahead up to 2020, and we're at this situation. It flattens out a bit. Now move ahead to 2050, and we've almost flattened it. It becomes more, it's, it's, it's a cylinder. It's like, you know, it's that, uh, it's Taipei 101. It's, it's, a, it's a skyscraper of some kind. And then we go back to, uh, say, by the year 2100, and again, every project, projection is, is, is completely off. There's all kinds of geopolitical things that will happen. And we're looking at a very flat population structure. A lot of older people, the number of people who are above the age of 65, tons of older people, and also a, a lot of, and very few younger people relative to where we are today. And the interesting part about this or projections like this is this shows you how the labor force is expected to shift through time. We have fundamental questions about what happens to older people. Is retirement possible? At what age is it possible? Some of this may be alleviated by, um, you know, futurists who talk about the uh, benefits of, of, of certain technologies with regards to the, advancing the human lifespan, and more importantly, the, the human, you know, combating human frailty as we get older and no longer are capable of, of working the same sort of jobs. I mean, in some ways that can help alleviate this, but we're going to have we're going to have some interesting shifts in the years ahead, certainly because of things like this um, over the very, very long run. <clears throat> this is really fun. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going back in these letters here. This is great. 20, oh, man, this is a great discussion here. 20 years. Uh, Albert noted what is truly crazy to witness in 20 years is when millennial, Gen Z, and Gen Alpha professionals failed to repopulate the country at the same rate as baby boomers. Having kids is expensive. We've got, I've got one eight-year-old son. Uh, he's enough. And I keep, I'm like, why is this so much money? No, I'm just kidding. He's great. He's, so far, his ROI is very low, but he's, I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding. He's the perfect child. Uh, Albert uh, uh, at Colin, the avocado coast, uh, <laughs> toast has already happened. The low population replacement will be worse. Just look at Japan and South Korea for the blueprint. Sean says, you need you people need to start having kids to fund my social security payments. That's right, Sean. Always, Sean Riley, it is good to see you as always. And more importantly, uh, uh, how timely and relevant that is. Colin says, social security is a Ponzi scheme. Change my mind. And then Aaron says, we need to include the US alien population, another 15 million, million or so, whose average age is 35. I love that, Aaron. So Aaron Reyes, when he talks about those things, uh, noting the amount of illegal immigration in the United States, but also the benefits of that within the economy, right? These are jobs everywhere from construction to other work and 
in labor and other aspects that are are doing a lot a lot to power the economy and and cannot be underestimated too and that's another reason this thing exists in, in many respects that as long as we can continue to do this and have a lot of uh, and have a lot of interest worldwide for coming to a country like the United US it does create a lot of benefits the stack of economic research this high on immigration in general uh that suggests that it does a lot for dynamics it makes economies more competitive it does a lot of things and one way we can help sort of <clears throat> Uh, potentially offset a fate that's similar to Japan and South Korea regarding the labor force size um, is would be would be a potential increase in immigration. But let's talk a little bit about this and let's talk about the employment to population ratio. So this is a question we get a lot um, is we think about the question, it seems like are people as employed as they were in previous generations? And so if we compare this from the 1989 to 2022 level and just look at the workers aged 25 to 54 and whether they're employed or not. And this is interesting because we've seen a lot of things happen in the last 33 years. A lot more people are in grad school at this age. A lot more people are doing other things, um, you know, and, and it makes it you, you ask the question and say, well, how, you know, are people actually dropping out of labor force who are of prime working age, this 25 to 54 demographic that I'm part of and a lot of other people here in this audience might be as well. Um, <clears throat> except for, of course, Sean, who's, you know, deep into his late 90s. Uh, but uh, one thing that, um, <laughs> just kidding, Sean. Uh, one thing that's important to note about this is our population ratio is about 80.1%. Um, that is near the high that we had right before the pandemic. And it's also near kind of the all time highs that we've seen uh, in previous good economic circumstances. So this is very close to as good as it gets regarding our employment to population ratio. So it's not that huge amounts of young people aren't working. They're actually working at rates that are similar to where they were uh, in previous years. It's actually pretty good, in fact. Now, other things to think about, um, the positive news about this, the last 40 years, we had uh, uh, the best two-year stretch of job creation in 40 years. What I don't like about this headline is it doesn't tell you as well. It's also because, you know, we had the worst immediate job crash that we had in 40 years, followed by the worst inflation in 40 years. But also, we have more job creation than in 40 years. A lot of things happen now that they haven't, we haven't seen in 40 years. And hopefully, I won't have to talk about it again until 40 years from now. But uh, this is it. And that's right. So Aaron says, this is really good. Aaron says, truth is we should model 16 to 25 in school or work, 54 to 62 given our extra years living versus 89. Very good point too, Aaron. A excellent demographics there. Uh, Albert, Albert, uh, uh, Albert screams into the void. Everything is so artificial these days. I miss the days when bad economic actors called calamity. I know. Why do we have to create our own shenanigans? Why can't we just have bad Lehman Brothers type financial institutions initiate a, a widespread crisis? Why does it have to be us? So one of the things that we have to think about, <laughs> and you look about this as whole, well, we get a lot of questions about, oh my goodness, we, the Royal We, but we, and, and we think about this from consulting and other things that we're out, we're out doing. Um, but we look at, say, how um, the job growth has affected different sectors. So one, one, uh, one chart I like showing occasionally is this ratio of quits, which are um, uh, on the uh, horizontal uh, axis here, quit rates, and then hiring rates, which are on the vertical axis. And normally there's a relationship between them. You get more quitting, you get more hiring um, uh, as a consequence to replace the quitters. But overall, it's been very good. Right now, hiring exceeds quitting across the industries. Um, and where you have the greatest quit rates and the greatest hiring rates are in low uh, wage industries. These are industries where you're struggling, that you have people who might be interested in working, but you don't have enough money there. These areas have been struggling to find labor and have a lot of labor shortages, accommodation and food services being one of them. And then arts, entertainment, and recreation is interesting. They actually had a really high quit rate uh, in the pandemic, um, and they hired slowly. Now they're hiring with a low quit rate, which is good. Very cyclical, arts, entertainment, and recreation. So if you're in that group, think about it as well. So Aaron says, how much uh, brought forward spending because of COVID delayed spending and massive money and fiscal stimulus? So that's a really interesting thing. So brought forward and, and put against. So, so we had it roughly a little bit more than $5 trillion of stimulus spending, which dwarfed all other previous uh, fiscal stimulus spending. That includes the major congressional bills, as well as the additional um, money that was allocated to, to benefit, um, uh, to benefit uh, people and firms. And the injection of that much capital, which is about one fourth of our annual GDP, um, was, was unprecedented. And it did have effect. And, and the question is, is what did it do? It did a lot of weird spending things. Um, when we initiated the spending, a lot of people started demanding a lot of things very quickly in ways that the um, companies didn't anticipate. 
Um, supply chains, which broke down or fell apart as a result of the pandemic closures in April and May of 2020, um, uh, they were suddenly, you know, uh, subjected to an increase in demand that they hadn't anticipated to buy stuff, to buy goods, to buy materials, these sort of things, and they weren't able to take care of it. And that really initiated the, 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 the inflationary environment we have today. And, you know, the other aspect of it, though, the economy didn't recover from, from, a very, from, from the closure period quite well. Um, oh, this is fun, Colin. Yeah, Colin talking about the great histories. Uh, uh, Lehman Brothers built on human greed, confusing financial in instruments in the fantasy of infinitely positive growth. I checked yesterday, these things are still running around. <laughs> I always check, it's always important. Um, and the safeguards that are there, the good news is relative to 2008, our financial sector is in a much better shape. Um, areas that we have low hiring and low quit rates include things like financial activities and durable goods manufacturing. We've seen some steadiness in wholesale trade that had a lot more hiring um, when we were building up in response to supply chain issues. That's leveling off. And you'll see a chart on that that I'll show you that shows how much it's leveled off in a big way. So anyway, so let's talk about this. So overall, the jobs market's still good, good, good. And we're focusing on the jobs market first because that dictates a lot of what the Fed is going to do in the next few months. The Fed won't do much. The, the, the real toll of the Fed is when customers are... Um, um, I'm sorry, companies cut back on investment in such a way that they're starting to limit hiring, that they're starting to lay off workers. And across sectors that are outside of technology, we haven't seen a lot of that yet. And that is why it's 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 tempting to look at the Fed and say, well, maybe there's more that we can do uh, from a policy perspective. And we'll get into that. So <clears throat> that's really good. Okay, so next up. So Aaron also says, uh, we're in the risk of reduced growth, lower aggregate demand, weaker investment, CapEx, clearing inventories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So job impact. So that's really interesting. So, so it created, you know, to go back to your initial question, Aaron, about the, the, the massive monetary and fiscal stimulus um, in spending. There's a few facts about humans that we've, we've studied. <laughs> we've, humans, humans, what are these humans? Uh, a few facts that we've studied lately about certain things. Um, that have come out in papers and other researchers have done uh, results in. One is the fact that, um, for one thing, when we have a very low amount of, we're low interest rates overall, um, what that does is it, find, it, it makes financing things uh, very cheap and means that you can charge a lot of money for things because people can take out bigger and bigger loans for these things. And you saw this for things like housing, but you also saw it for other asset prices across the board. When people see increases in things like housing prices, we know from research that they feel more confident about how much money they have. They feel richer because their house price is worth a bit more. And while less evident in the Bay Area where you're looking at uh, some year and year declines in real estate values, um, it is uh, incredibly evident in a lot of the country uh, where people uh, recognize the benefit and increased equity and that powered a lot of their spending and purchasing decisions. Um, and it made them, it, made, it changed sort of the risk return mentality for a lot of people, uh, which does affect things like demand and investment, capex, inventories, that kind of thing. Inventories, by the way, their most recent numbers are, they're, they're ticking upwards, uh, which is not usually a good sign. It usually means that they're, they're not clearing them fast enough. So right now, um, we saw a large amount of spending. Then people became accustomed to the spending. They ran up credit to a level that, that was very high. We had a lot of savings initially in the pandemic. Um, that savings rate has since gone down to some of the lowest levels that we've seen, and credit card and household debt is 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 nearing local highs. So so there's some sense that can, the consumer in general is still pretty stressed. We're going to fight inflation. <laughs> That's right. I like Colin very well put. A stagployment. Look at this great discussion. So Albert and Colin going back and forth talking about the relationship between uh, economic activity uh, and, of course, uh, the Federal Reserve. And, and the, we know that everything is delayed. We know that, that they are cutting back investments in certain ways. And while that has affected some industries like tech, um, it's uh, not affected everything universally yet. Um, <clears throat> Aaron, good point. With higher discount interest rates, investment returns require more rigor. It's revenge of CAPM. CAPM empire strikes again. The capital asset pricing model, or CAPM, been invented back in the 60s. We taught it to a bunch of MBAs in the 80s. It's now used in over two thirds of capital budgeting decisions. It's how firms figure out things like how much, uh, what their target, what their hurdle rates might be, um, what their cost of equity uh, might be. What other words, what they're trying to make. Uh, uh, um, it's a hurdle rate because it tells us what it costs them to uh, pay their equity holders. And as a consequence, when you invest in a new thing in that company, they got to beat that number to result in a profit. So it's a very cool thing. So anyway, some inflation numbers that we're going to hit out first. So here's the other good news you saw today. Inflation update, 6.5%. 
I'd highlight this in magical colors. And it, we hit the nail on the head. It reached consensus estimates about six and a half percent. So the good news is it wasn't a surprise and it was still good. And the market was like, man, we already priced this in. But inflation met market forecast at about six and a half percent. That's an annualized number. And that fell from the annualized 7.1% that we saw in November. And it's down from our annualized 9.1% number that we had back in June. So we turned the corner and now we're headed downhill and we're headed downhill pretty fast. But like all things, all products are not created equal. So those are those of you, Albert, Albert, of course, being sensible in investments, invested heavily in eggs back in June. And since that time has recognized huge profits as he's held on to those eggs in a secret underground facility underneath Albert's list headquarters. Um, and uh, one thing as well, so lettuce is actually up. Leafy vegetables are up, uh, uh, but no mention of other green leafy veggies. My understanding is that's that's a that's a Salinas Valley thing. Uh, we look at lettuce. Lettuce prices are up domestically based on local um, local harvest, um, and that's affecting a lot of things. All well, the eggs in one basket. Scott Nicholson, give this guy a, a magic star. That's hilarious. Um, so one thing that we have here: egg arbitration and hoarding. Oh my God, I love this crowd today. You guys are delightful. Uh, call options on jumbo eggs. Egg arbitrage. I love it. This is great. I know. Ah, oh, man. Omelets. Uh, 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 it is <clears throat> uh, yields and yolks. It will be our next uh, podcast. Uh, energy was up about 7.3%. Things like used cars and trucks, right? We saw huge increases in that earlier last year. Since that time, it's been a little bit, little bit of up and down, but mainly down. They're since continued, the last couple of months, continuing their downward trend. Uh, if you bought a used car or truck uh, in the last year, you paid more probably than you should have. But uh, the good news is they're coming down. Financing fees, of course, are also coming up. So it's a double-edged sword. You might be paying as much as you would have previously, depending on the rate of interest. Airline fares are... Uh, uh, down about 3.1%, not up 3.1% uh, in this case, although you wouldn't imagine it um, from the uh, various crises we had last month. And then new vehicles are down about 0.1%. So the shelter index, and this is very important, the cost of shelter, it's a lagging index. It's the cost of things like apartments and housing. We saw increases in that um, in heavily in, in mid-2022. That's only showing up because of the nature of the calculation in this index now. And so a lot of this delayed metric in, in shelter isn't that shelter prices are accelerating now. It's picking up shelter data that had happened earlier this year. And that's also creating sort of this, this impression that it's very, very high. So let's think about this. So let's think about other things. So you're looking at this as well. We got hot dogs. So if you had, you know, your, your lunch was a hot dog wrapped in butter. <laughs> with an egg. Uh, and of course, you had some lettuce on there. You're, you're, you're suffering right now. You're probably suffering as well physically, but you're also suffering uh, uh, mentally because of the amount that you're paying on these extra goods. Dairy, coffee, electricity, and poultry all up more uh, uh, than, than they were in prior years. And well, that's a boon if you invested heavily in, uh, uh, in, um, in rural real estate. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, it's not so good for all the other aspects of the market. Omelets as a service. Aaron, there you go. My new startup, upside down VCs who need bad warrants for their mispriced portfolio. Bam. So the Fed may still increase rates. And here's why. And this is the thing. So the Fed is looking for the response in the job market. The job market is still going strong. So the Fed really wants rates to be down to 2%. The Federal Reserve has what's called a dual mandate. They want rates down to 2%. Um, uh, inflation down to 2%, and they also want full employment. Full employment they have, um, and so they're going to keep pushing in ways to get this number lower. So we're not going to go through a period where we're looking at 75 basis point increases again on the discount rate. I think they might still raise, but it won't be that much, thinking like a quarter of a percent. Uh, uh, half a percent would really surprise me on the upper side. And it's also possible they'll do nothing. But right now, I, I give it a 60% shot. It'll be about 0.25% uh, when they meet later this month to raise rates again. Uh, or, or think about, or they meet to discuss the question of rate, rate issuances. And uh, they're still looking at these numbers. These numbers are much higher. And while asset prices are falling, are they falling fast enough to, 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 to keep the uh, Fed happy? Um, they are falling at a very good clip and the Fed is going to monitor this. And my suspect is that we'll end up um, with elevated rates for a while as these numbers dip more towards 2%. 
On the downside, what the Fed is also watching for is we see if we see any indicators that uh, layoffs are increasing rapidly or there's something else nefarious happening in the marketplace, the Fed's going to start cutting rates to incentivize investment. And um, and the hope is, is that they can offset this. And hopefully they're still attempting to do this, to raise rates this quickly without having a recession, which they have a really poor record of doing in the past. But it'll be interesting to see if they can pull it off. Albert says he thinks that naturally return uh, will return to 2% as we move uh, off from the pandemic. Maybe one of life's latest lost causes will be the artificial calamity and subsequent wealth transfer. Yeah, my 2023 prediction, Albert's got one. Inflation is low fours by the spring. The Fed pivots by May. Oh, by May. And we have a hard landing anyway. So I definitely agree on the Fed on the Fed pivoting. I think this year, the market's already priced in. If you look at the, the bond market is often very surprised. When people say it's priced into the market already, and that might be the best guess of the market, the market can be surprised and the bond market can be catastrophically wrong. I'm going to reiterate that. That happened in 07. That happened in other times. We've got a long history of the bond market being wrong. But it's also possible that um, if they are correct, <laughs> Uh, they are pricing in uh, inflation um, by uh, around the 3% level by the end of the year, which is really, really remarkable. And, and that is also my hope. Um, so you say low fours by the spring. I think we'll get there. I think what's going to hold us a little bit high, and I'll explain why, are a couple other things. Um, if inflation ends up being bigger than that, here's one of the reasons why. So one aspect on this is we had, of course, that sort of long-term discussion in the markets. You know, what's going to happen when... Uh, we had this huge amount of goods inflation. When are we going to see the service inflation? And people were calling this for months. Economists and pundits were saying, oh, we're going to see service inflation, service inflation, service inflation. To give you a sense of that, this is the difference between goods, you know, buying that stuff, those component parts, those prices we saw increasing through the roof uh, because of supply chain issues and services, what we're charging for all that other stuff in the economy, ranging from everything from the IT work to the lawyers, to the, to the doctors, to the, uh, to the financial professors that are out there doing things and making things happen. And right now we've actually seen uh, increases in our service inflation, even as goods inflation has declined dramatically. And that's very, very interesting. So I don't think this will be persistent. Um, and I think we're seeing the reaction to the goods inflation we expected earlier, um, but it is still increasing. And that's important to note. And maybe the Fed pivots sooner once these Q1 earnings end up being bloody red. That's true. We'll see that. Uh, I'll show you what, what some thoughts are about that. Colin says, a monthly reminder, lowering CPI back to 2% just means we're no longer accelerating as fast. Inflation rate is still acceleration. Our velocity hasn't stopped. The only way to lower velocity is to have deflation deceleration, which most economic policy wants to avoid. That's true. Gas will never be $3 again. I like that. I like. The, I love uh, making a very logical financial statement followed by a bold predict prediction. It might be, it might not be. I, I don't know. That depends heavily on demand. It's possible we can shift consumer demand away from gas in such a way that gas prices ultimately become low. Uh, but of course, gas will be three dollars again, Colin. It'll probably be two fifty in Texas in the summer. I know you do pay. You do. It is. It is heavy in California. They're not as bad as when I was driving out there. That that I anticipated it would be. So Aaron says goods versus services inflation. I see it with labor costs, which are still transmitted across the economy. It might take another year. Uh, agreed. I think it's going to be a longer time, Aaron, before we see a lot of the goods inflation drop off. Albert says, I feel like goods inflation is more important than services inflation. Goods are inelastic when you choose to hire for a basket of services. Uh, who you choose to hire for a basket of services is dependent on your ability to discern work quality. Like you need water, gas, groceries, but you could also choose to go to Whole Foods or Sprouts. Different price range. You're absolutely right. And our, your interpretation of that is, is true, but it's also true on some level that, um, you know, and I do think consumers do have the ability to discriminate within service inflation, but you are seeing, of course, effects of labor costs, but you're also seeing some other things that are a little bit trickier. Um, and it is, it, is, it is within the system itself as it adjusts to hiring. It, it's a matter of not just labor, labor being short. Uh, do we have the right people in the right jobs? And, and as we can see, judging by the amount of available jobs and our unemployment rate, the answer is no. And um, some things to think about too, supply chain metrics, and this is from Arbor Data Science, have softened quite a bit. And as you've kind of seen, one reason you can start buying more stuff again that you might not have been able to uh, months earlier is all the metrics we use to look at supply chains, things like commodity prices, right? Consumer inflation expectations, Mannheim used vehicle value, small business compensation plans, small business price plans, supplier delivery time, the one most directly uh, related to supply chain metrics, and then unleaded gasoline. All those shot up in tandem in 2021, 20, early 2022. And since then, they are falling off of a cliff. 
uh, in prices, which bodes very well for getting things shipped in and getting things done. And that's benefiting a lot of businesses. And so whether or not these benefits will eventually exceed, so we're kind of pulling in both directions. So the businesses are dealing with higher uh, investment costs, and then they're dealing with an alleviation of their supply chain concerns. And, and the question is, is which one of these factors will, it's a struggle of dominance right now. And right now, businesses have continued to be successful due to the alleviation of supply chain concerns. But ultimately, will the price pressure, will the pressure of continued high investment rates pull businesses in an adverse direction in the near future? And that is the real question that we have to kind of address that will happen potentially shortly. So Aaron also says, issue with service inflation is that labor and elastic limits and service contracts make it difficult. That's a very good point. Uh, we may go in a place where goods are just deflationary and labor has inflation. Labor is, is, is remains a perpetual uh, uh, our question here. But again, one of the aggregate things, if I go back to this, we're not seeing that associated in aggregate wage growth. We do see higher wage growth in certain sectors that are seeing, um, that have the greatest uh, shortages, things like leisure and hospitality. But that's been that way since the beginning beginning of the recession. And this is very interesting. So that's a good thing as well. And this has two big factors into this too. And this is right too, because people, this is this has been timely. It's the start of the year. So I had a lot of media questions around, say, the um, different states that have started, you know, raising minimum wages across the board. What effects that had, right? And, you know, and people are always, one question they ask is minimum wage affect inflation? Uh, usually not. Um, and it's usually because people who earn minimum wage, it's not that people, they're, they're less than or they're doing jobs that aren't desirable. They're people, people earning minimum wage um, just represent a very small percentage of the overall consumer spending in the overall market. To move the market in a big way, you have to really have a large, widespread, large amount of money sloshing around in ways that you don't have where the market can absorb correctly. And that's not the case with minimum wage. Minimum wage does have some other effects, though. Um, it changes the nature of, of employment. Um, studying us uh, when Seattle raised it from eleven dollars to thirteen dollars uh, a couple years back, um, although it's much it's higher now. Uh, they noted that uh, uh, producers or, or companies cut hours uh, between six and seven percent on average. Uh, there's a bunch of other data to suggest that. You know, um, you know, when minimum wage increases, people uh, uh, start. Um, uh, employers demand more from these workers, and it changes the makeup of those workers. They're not hiring teenagers anymore. They're hiring more experienced professionals. And so it's very interesting to think about this. So, so, so people look at this context in particular this year, um, and it's, it's being sent, seen through a lot of different lenses. And it's a, it's a very interesting topic. Ah, yes. So you know, the vehicle crash should be going to <laughs> Carvana. Is labor inflation actually a big deal? Weren't we looking at stats one or two months ago that showed that the highest gains were not wages, but actually corporate profits? That's right. So uh, aren't we currently in a cor cor corporate profit-driven inflation? That's a really good question. That is incredibly nebulous to figure out. So one question is, of course, and when we think about that, and, and I want to, this is, that's a very, very good question, Colin. So, so when we look at what makes, corporation profit profit you know it's it's a complex question and from a corporation's perspective they'll say well you know you know we're making rational economic decisions because of the pressures that are demanded on us so instead of say uh pressing for higher wages they might say oh we're building our you know our reserves in the event of an economic downturn next year that every economist in the world has been predicting so so there's been a lot of of debate on this you know i think you know we think about things and i want to let's see if i can I saw a really interesting inequality chart lately um, that looked at the income uh, changes. And it's overall, you know, uh, I'll have to get it. I won't be able to get it in time. Um, I forget where I put it. I put it, I keep, I see charts, I save charts, and I have it in my like chart file. I need like a chart. And I want an old school chart holder. But anyway, one of those things um, is you have this, this, this overall perception that um, that, you know, what really drove, what's driving price increases. You know, it is true that goods prices increased. Those are fundamental costs that were passed on to consumers in the form of higher product prices. And as this relieves and as investment increases, you know, consumers don't have enough money for these things. You saw that, um, and consequently, um, when you see less demand on certain goods or they don't, or demand shifts in certain ways that results in price decreases. But I think that, you know, to get at this question, it's not necessarily that corporations have, have, have done, you know, all nefarious things and have intentionally withheld wages without doing it. I think they've prioritized profits to their shareholders. And I think that is a function of sort of the modern equity economy in that sense. And, and, and I think that's true. And I think that's why, you know, 
you know, one thing that's really interesting, look at share buybacks, right? If you think of yourself as a shareholder, a lot of you own company shares. Most of you probably own something in somewhere, either through directly in your, in your accounts or you own a 401k or something like that. And, and you have shares. And an interesting aspect of this is um, we look at share buybacks dating from the early 1990s. Companies took out debt to buy back stock. Debt is usually cheaper to finance than stock. You know, you have to pay more on dividends, other things. And debt can be really, really cheap in like the last 10 years, for instance. But back in that era in early 90s, you actually could buy back the number of shares. And what that does is it reduces the number of shares outstanding. And uh, if your company is still worth the same, it means your result, uh, if you take the same value of that company, $100 billion, and now instead of 20 million, um, I'm sorry, 20 billion shares, um, you have 10 billion. That means your price has gone up from uh, five to $10 just by buying back shares or so the logic went. They've done that study again in 2015 and 2019 in different aspects. And they found that share buybacks don't really work anymore. They're not really seen as that way. Investors are wise to them. And even though they're buying back and spending money, buying back value in an effort to reduce, increase stock prices, uh, they're taking on a lot of debt and it's not really resulting in uh, stock prices that are increasing higher relative to uh, industry levels. And that's really interesting. So it's a bit of a tricky situation. It sounds like a good idea for shareholders, but it's not. But mentality across the share across the board is to communicate profitability and to communicate equity. So Aaron says 60, 80% of firm investment profits uh, across the quadrant by segment leaders, while uh, the middle half provide average services slash good manufacturers, while the lowest quadrant uh, are bought by PE during lower AD period. Oh man, there's so much PE money sloshing around these days. Um, Albert says, what's crazy is the amount of companies uh, who spend uh, to get rid of employees, though, from COBRA to severance to knowledge drain. Companies really should cut OPEX first. Ooh, this is good. I like this. This is a real, this is this is a, a fantastic discussion. Every corporation is different, though. That's all I can say, is there's many bad ones who are terribly inefficient with money and many clever ones that are very good with it. And so when in these analyses, it makes me hard to, to paint a brush broadly across this, the table on this. But um, when you think about this, as you've seen, what a year it's been in stocks, everybody. January through January, what have you done? How's your portfolio has been? Are you afraid to look across the board, especially in tech companies, uh, especially uh, across the board from Apple uh, to Microsoft, to Alphabet, to Amazon? Uh, we've seen a downward trend across the board. Technology companies are most prone to changes in investment expectations. So when the Fed raises rates, it makes all of their investments uh, uh, in long-term growth more expensive. It also helps reduce that 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 um, that that future growth rate that investors expect to receive. And so what that does is, when even though they you know. Uh, tech companies are so responsive to this because not much of their earnings is, is growth focused in the long run and slight deviations, slight changes in anticipated growth rates in the negative in a negative way, not only affects next year's earnings, but earnings 10, 20, 30 years down the line. And the cumulative effect of all those things results in a decline in stock price. And across the board, you've kind of seen that. So Aaron says, uh, if buybacks are blended with dividends, issue warrants that probably best practice going forward. You know, that's a very interesting argument. I like that too. Um, if buybacks are blended with dividends, issue warrants, you know, that kind of stuff, probably best practice. I agree in some sense. I think we have a lot, a lot of work to do to get, you know, the average investor up to a financial literacy standard. But of course, if you're dealing with the BlackRock types and the other wealth, um, wealth firms out there, they, you know, they would grapple with that well. Um, I think that, I think generally speaking, though, it's a very short-sighted dialogue. I think that firms can do things to boost value and ways like that, that would, that would be substantially better. Whether that comes from, say, dividends or whether it comes from warrants and things, that's, that's on the table. But I like that concept. It's probably, you know, I'm interested in the convertible side. There's a lot of things they can do. Um, to actually help make this happen. So will the Fed pivot? And pivot means, will the Fed go from raising rates and making stuff more expensive for businesses uh, and consumers, or will they lower rates? And inflation has cooled in response to policy rate changes. However, these are the bottom line points. The job market remains strong. Service inflation continues to rise. And uh, the Fed Chair Powell uh, has focused on three big concerns in his most recent communique. Uh, goods, shelter, and what we call core services, excluding shelter. 
Goods inflation increased as pandemic related, related supply chain issues spread. Shelter is a lagging indicator. It already reflects house rent prices. I don't think that's that important regarding the, the, the CPI moving forward. What I do think is kind of important, and I agree with Macro Compass on this, is that core services, excluding shelter, has declined significantly. And that's very, very interesting. Core services, even as service inflation in general continues to rise, core services continues to drop. This is really sticky sometimes as a movement. It's very hard to move this. And we've actually seen a substantial drop in this in response to the Fed policy changes. I still think, though, the Fed's paying attention to this. They're viewing their results as very effective. That is uh, a, a, that is a good argument, in my opinion, as to why they might hesitate, they might pause on rate increases. I still think, judging by the strength in the job market, depends on how greedy they get and wanting to reduce those big inflation numbers or how patient they have it. And you know, it seems very tricky to look up ahead of time and try to engage how the market will respond to long-term events in a very short-term horizon. But making policy rate changes now, uh, it's clear we're nearing where they expect the maximum uh, short-term rate to be. For everyone's benefit, what are core services? Oh man, let's bring out, let's bring out my, my chart. I have all kinds of things. So. So these are things that are needed. We need everywhere. I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find a very specific spread chart on core services. Da -da -da. Consumer price services less energy services. Okay, that's a very good question. Less food and energy. Nope, not the one I want to see. Fred has, if you go into the Federal Reserve economic data, they have such an amazing uh, collection of very useful data. But core services are things that um, uh, uh, you think about that uh, things need everything from spending on um, uh, certain construction elements like roads to other things. I'm trying to think of, let's see if we can expand it a little bit more. Um, There you go. Well, that's why we're excluding shelter. <laughs> so call it. It's core services, less shelter, uh, which is why we have this, which is good. But I agree, shelter is core, but shelter is also a lagging figure. And so, and so because of that, um, it kind of throws off what we think. So anything, and broadly speaking, you know, looking at things like um, da, 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 uh, da, 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 any intent, it could be, um, intangible acts um, that a consumer, a firm, uh, governments are willing to pay for uh, that represent everything from healthcare to um, uh, other aspects of uh, the uh, critical financial industry, uh, uh, elements on things like investment and other services, and things that exclude things like shelter. So I want to get the most thorough definition possible. Cleveland Fed, there we go. Let's see what we got here from this guy here. That's good. Now casting. Good, good, good call, Aaron. So excluding excluding shelter CPI has gone down, and this has been good. And I like the Cleveland Fed's data. That's pretty good. Core CPI now casting updated. That's pretty good. That's fun. Although this is more of a, yeah, I like that. That's cool. All right. So anyway, let's talk about this. So one of the things that we observed as well was we had a drop in mortgage purchases uh, that you've seen as a result of the um, financial issues that we've experienced. Uh, as a result of higher rates, people have stopped buying mortgages. And we had a 45, 44% annual drop in mortgage purchases index in, in uh, the last year. This is the largest decline that we've actually ever seen. And it's driven by such an increase that we've seen. Now, we know the Fed doesn't determine mortgage rates. Mortgage rates often follow most anything, the 10 year bond. Uh, but we've seen such a decline in these rates uh, as a response to higher mortgage rates driven by higher overall rates that uh, that people have uh, that this has really taken the bottom out of a lot of the real estate economy. And that's why many believe that uh, real estate, which represents anywhere between 10 and 15 percent of the GDP, is likely to drop at some point uh, 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 in the future, not only just in the Bay Area and other places where we've seen minimal drops, but we were likely to see going to be seeing a potential, in, uh, I guess, a continued uh, result or decline in asset prices over the next year or so. 
Um, now, delayed indicators. Rents versus used cars. Oh, not the wrong one. Wrong chart. I got rid of that chart. So I actually have this one here, and I wanted to go back in the markets because I said this is this is actually really fun. So one of the ways we can look at one of the weirdest thing about financial markets is that when we think about investment for the future, while you know historically that sort of economic adage that people are rational decision makers when it comes to economic decisions, it's not always that way. We can actually look at um, earnings across the board, and what we found out is that although earnings should drive stock price growth, stock price market capitalization, it's not always that way. So in 2022, in the third quarter, information technology, um, which represented about 26% of the total index market cap, only represented about 19.5% of index earnings. And so when you think about that, it's such a big sector. Of course, the prices were going to be under pressure to go down um, because you know, you're looking at a sector where you, 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 you weigh more than what you're actually worth and what you're actually showing us in earnings. Healthcare was, on the other hand, is pretty on point. Um, if I compare that to energy, energy had almost three times uh, the earnings weight that it had for index market cap driven by higher oil prices, because investors know that was a temporary thing and it was caused by a number of individual issues. It didn't end up going in that direction. And so that's a very, very interesting phenomenon. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Thanks. Ah, there we go. Thank Good find, Aaron. I like when I like you did the homework. Aaron's out there. Uh, that last link Aaron did on the Fred St. Louis graph here, uh, U.S. city averages, and it shows really a nice picture of uh, the consumer price index for urban consumers and all items less food and energy. Uh, great explanation at the bottom as well. Great links, Aaron. Thank you, sir. All right. So on this one, too, you can see kind of in this, the big takeaway from this is, is that earnings are not matching the market cap, primarily in information, tech and energy. Doesn't mean necessarily you should invest in energy. Actually, you know, remember that the market doesn't, the market's forward looking. It doesn't take into account what already happened. But you should take this into account regarding, say, the way that you look at and the way that you interpret information in your portfolio. Aaron GPT. <laughs> I know you're the most advanced AI based Aaron platform that I've seen on, on Albert's list. That's very good. Aaron. <laughs> That's good. So on the other hand of this, so you have this stuff, the markets have been iffy, things are on fire. Take a look at this one on the other hand. So um, Macro Compass points at this chart a lot and I have a difficult time. So the credit impulse, which is another way of looking at you know, one of the ways we can anticipate growth for firms as well as earnings is there's a relationship in credit and, and uh, being investment, uh, resulting in investment that results in profits, right? And so this connected, that's okay. Albert, I really appreciate that. That's okay. If you're, if I'm, you know, I was using chat. This is, I, we'll talk about chat GPT in a second. I found it so amusing. Obviously it hit academia by storm. I had all my colleagues going there asking this. I put my own test questions in there. And I have to say, if I was grading my questions on a curve, uh, they were pretty good, some of those answers. Some of them were not. Some of them were, were, were foolish. And this was kind of the act, what was going around academic Twitter lately was, was the question of, uh, of, of chat GPT and whether or not uh, you can replace student work with this. And of course, it's calling a bluff that higher education has had for a long time. We often don't update our materials, our courses, our information in a way that allows people uh, to... to uh, um, adequately go around it. And so, you know, you look at this and I really like, um, there's a substack stack that uh, Matt Iglesias wrote about, uh, you know, how this will alter training in the future AI. Um, and I think it's probably true. And education is one of those industries. You know, the way that we learn, the way that we educate will, will inevitably have to change. I have a lot of other separate thoughts about that, but it's very, very interesting. So do you have students using chat GBT to write papers? Yes. And can I tell not all the time? <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. Uh, some of them, it depends on the nature of how they word the question to the AI. Um, sometimes they word the question <laughs> poorly. Um, I've been evaluating ChatGPT for my work. Colin says, yes, this is good. Make resume. Colin, this is good. Go on, go on everyone. Make it happen. This is very good. 25 years in the AI mind. Aaron says, the only issue, it'll be 60% correct 60% of the time. That's right. Still pretty good, though. But if your average is only a 36 Oh man, you're, 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 you're shooting well, especially, I gotta, be, I gotta be more careful with my tests. So anyway, the credit impulse is the idea that, okay, we have all of this credit taken out that leads to investment and that's fallen off a cliff. The credit impulse as a result of all these higher rates and stuff has gone away. That usually means that the S&P 500 
um, year on year earnings per share growth, which powers a lot of our interpretation for how companies are doing, is also going to head downhill. Uh, but there's a delay. And it's a delay that ranges uh, by between four and 12 months in historical times. But the likelihood is that it might hit us in 2023. And it looks like if the credit impulse is correct, that it's dropping off a cliff. I don't venture to say it's also offset by a large amount of other information to suggest that maybe we'll be a little bit more even keeled in this. But what causes me some worry and some pause is we haven't really seen or haven't had the opportunity to see year and year earnings per share numbers as they would be in the first quarter and second quarter of next year. Once we get those values, specifically in April after the first quarter, and then again, we get those uh, values in July, we'll have a much better picture of how the economy is doing, much better picture. But take an eye on this, and this is kind of like my warning. The global footprint of the United States is smaller than implied by its dominant stock market. This was a chart from the Financial Times, but I liked it so much I included it here. So one aspect about markets and finance in general, and, and this is very interesting, and any of you, especially all of you who come from different backgrounds or immigrant backgrounds or recent immigrant backgrounds, you know, you, you, you feel this quite acutely. The U.S. bats, uh, uh, or it feels like we fight at a higher weight, I should say, uh, than, than we otherwise would for our economic side. Right now, we're about a quarter of the world's GDP in the United States. Our market capitalization, our equity market capitalization looks like it's like post-World War II again. Uh, the United States has 60% of the global market capitalization. 60% of the global market capitalization, greatly disproportionate from our working age population, which represents about 4%. Corporate earnings, which represent about 45, 47%, and then the number of listed companies, which is in the low 20s. We do more with us. I hope so. Albert. I don't know. I'm I'm very interested in this. Uh, and this has been remarkably persistent in the last decade or two. Um, really, Americans work harder than oh, Colin with a bitingly hard uh, but very true critique. Clearly, Americans work harder than sweatshops in Asia. Oh, my gosh. But I mean, at the same time, though, that's the question of value, right? This is the value ownership uh, uh, phenomenon. This will, too, shift uh, in coming years. And what that will do to long-term market performance is up in the air. And this, this causes some people a lot of worry. Um, consensus estimates. So let's get down to brass tacks here. What are we doing in the next year? Um, so it's 7 o'clock. Thank you guys for, who have hung on for this all along. And we're, we're going to wrap it up with a couple slides here. And then I'll, I'll open up for more Q&A. So consensus estimates are around 0.4% GDP growth in 2023. I think this might be more, this might be close to spot on. And I'm not a yet, I haven't seen enough information to suggest that we're going to be more like a 1% or 2% GDP growth. I don't expect a massive positive surprise. But I still think, though, because of the fundamentals of the job market, we might do okay. What I'm waiting for are those first quarter and second quarter EPS estimates that will dictate a lot of how the job market feels in response to the economic changes that we'll get. So the U.S. economy will probably make half a percent. I think Europe and the U.K., I agree with this. This is a um, J.P. Morgan um, uh, uh, measure. Uh, um, or uh, that, uh, or Goldman, I'm sorry, uh, that economies in Europe and the UK are likely to contract. I think that's true. I think that emerging market economies should recover modestly. I also think that's true. Now, the other thing that's been said, if you read this headline in the Wall Street Journal, economists think they can see a recession coming for a change. Most of the time, recessions are a surprise, but they really shouldn't be. The most obvious answers right now is that is that they're out there. But again, with the indicator with the yield curve, we always say that an inverted yield curve creates a recession or or doesn't create a recession, but it indicates a recession is coming, often an indicator that's right for the wrong reasons. But there are some things I want you to think about specifically, tech layoffs. So we're seeing tech layoffs here so far. This is okay. Workers are highly skilled and they have places to go, courtesy of places like Albert's List. But this wasn't the case if you're a layman brother investment banker. There's a finite number of investment banks. They aren't going to go to commercial banks really easily or quickly or willingly. And so as a consequence in 2008, and when I was a banker, um, there was not a large amount of places for people to go. We had a collapse of a segment of the economy, which isn't really happening here. Now, consumers are also much better off than in 2008, meaning that we're better financed. There's a few ways we're not better off, and consumers do have a lot of debt, um, and uh, they're a little bit less careful now um, in recent months 
months regarding their credit and their household credit. Um, and the financial sector as a whole, and this is fundamental, is much healthier. Um, the banks themselves have recognized pretty solid profits in the last year. Uh, they've taken that not to pay workers, but to bolster their reserves in, in response for an expected downturn next year. And firms are acting really cautiously, and they have plenty of savings. These are good signs of risk management. So it's very interesting that in the aspect of predicting this, could we predict our way out of a recession is my question. Could we have been so negative that because people are being more careful, we won't engage in the type of things beforehand? It sounds like hubris, but it also sounds like it actually might be somewhat possible. But again, I think right now, where I was looking at it, maybe a chance of a more major recession, I see it being more minor at this point. Um, this is good. Aaron says, real issues, U.S. financial markets maturity versus 90% of Earth. Most markets are not mature. Some of them are really mature, though. But I mean, you know, but some of them are not. That's a good point. Um, but maturity is also can be can be there's not a, a clear pathway to maturity. It's not because, you know, if you look at the pathway of the United States from, say, the 1880s to today, there's been a lot of volatility and a lot of money have come come into the equation. I think part of maturity is 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 uh, systems of law, systems of finance have to be mature. Uh, you have to have a system of government that that's considered stable and protective of investors. Uh, Albert says 70 percent of those laid off in March 22 and after found a job in three months or less. Um, uh, are there fewer alternatives that investment bankers can go to? Can you transfer your skills to being a financial analyst? Yes, but would you want to? And wealth managers, yes, but there was at that point a limited, a limited market for this. When I was in banking, the writing was on the wall in 08. I had to get into grad school. I ended up getting for a, uh, going for the PhD at uh, University of Connecticut. Uh, that was uh, that was available. They had one opening in July uh, prior to the August of admission. It was a very strange situation. By the skin of my teeth, I you know I got in there. And then they laid off most of my unit, uh, I guess all of my unit, uh, about a month after I left, is what I understand. Uh, Lucy uh, Thompson says, as a mom of a 22-year-old, congratulations, just graduated from college. Awesome, Lucy, that's great news. And an 18-year-old just accepted to college. I can say the college is much more expensive. The middle class is getting squeezed. I agree. As a as a literal a college administrator, I can't agree more to than this than than Lucy. It does. It's really really hard, and there's a lot of reasons for this. You know, it's very hard, especially um, state-funded institutions in particular. And uh, you know, I know it depends. And I don't know if they went to a state or a private education, but both prices are increasing rapidly. State-funding institutions are interesting. The more successful or able you are at generating funds, the less the legislature usually gives you. And so there's this little tug of war of, of efficiency, but there's also not a really a sense in, in, in many colleges about looking at questions of fiscal uh, austerity and efficiency in a reasonable way. Uh, it's very challenging. I have a lot of thoughts in higher ed in general, but I won't, I won't bore you with them. Uh, Aaron says at Colin Y, that's deterministic, developing ETFs to overtake mutual funds, which 85% of us still don't have. I would argue could, US could securitize 100 trillion more in the next 20 years. That's the ambition, the raised capital bank coming at you. Uh, Dr. White's collecting his big checks. Yes. Uh, just big checks, not from uh, Albert's list is for free, but this is, <laughs> yes, I just, yes, I drink only out of gilded cups now. Um, uh, Colin says, I don't know, the endowment is probably getting the loans cut. This is fun. I love the, uh, this is a good discussion today on this. Um, so anyway, there's uh, some mixture in here. My outlook is, is for slightly positive economic growth geared towards the first quarter and specifically the first two quarters. I think we will see negative GDP uh, in the third quarter or fourth quarter uh, right now. And that's a projection. And I, you know, I, I hope I'm wrong about all this. I hope it's more mild. Uh, and um, and I think we're going to see some of these downturns that have been kind of percolating for a while really hit. I think consumers, I think um, the market is underestimating to the extent that consumers uh, uh, um, uh, value uh, are tied to their, their consumer confidence is tied to their perceived value of real estate. A lot of consumers bought houses uh, during and at the height of, of asset prices. Um, you know, another 10% drop would put a lot of consumers underwater that will make them feel less rich. Dr. White of the Hanseatic League. I love it. Good old, I'll represent Lubeck or Danzig or uh, all the other states, uh, city states of the, of the uh, medieval period in the Hanseatic League. That's actually, that's really clever, Albert, Aaron. Let's make it happen. Let's have a small uh, uh, organizational Albert's List based conglomerate uh, where we go off to uh, develop and securitize funds uh, from third world countries, hopefully ethically. Uh, I like it. So this is good, done and done. All right, last bit, the Bay Area breakdown. You waited for the Bay Area, here it is. And you're like, Riley, what about San Jose? I'm gonna get five, 15 emails. We'll start with San Francisco, Oakland and Hayward. 
Right now, unemployment ticked up 2.8. Interesting to note, between October and November, the labor force in the Bay Area dropped about 10,000, uh, almost 11,000. Uh, that's, that's, that's the biggest decline we've seen in labor force in a while that was kind of steadily edging up. Um, uh, you know, one data point doesn't make a trend. We need a couple more in there. Uh, that 10K, and you look at where, where does the drop go? Because it doesn't seem like from the actual sector base that we're seeing anything. In fact, non-farm employment also increased. And so where did this go and what happened with it? And, and that's a really interesting question. So it's possible we're looking at an aggregate data in the non-farm data. You're looking at two specific elements of the surveys, which don't appear to be agreeing well, which happens sometimes when we have smaller samples, like in a metropolitan area, as opposed to a national area. But uh, the big picture is this, we're not yet seeing, and so some of you are like, are these information sector people? We're not seeing those hits in the information sector. We're not seeing those things yet. Those are gonna be cooked in. You're gonna see that in the next few months. You know, of course, as Albert pointed out last time, uh, we had a, um, we know that the layoffs, a lot of layoffs are structured in such a way uh, that many people maintain employment for months ahead of time and or compensation arrangements in such a way where they don't need or are seeking a job in some way. And, and Albert, you point out very, very well too. I think because uh, companies gave so many generous severances, we won't see meta, Twitter, et cetera, layoff data um, until March, April. And it might be bad. You might be right about that too. That'd be really, really interesting to note. Um, oh, anecdotally, Colin says, it is a blood bath. And that's a blood, that's not normal blood, that's blood with uh, approximately five O's. It's a blood bath, uh, which in uh, uh, my understanding is in the Silicon Valley parlance, uh, particularly uh, a bad blood bath. Um, and Aaron points out many high wage earners don't file for unemployment, also true. And so you're seeing, you might see it manifest itself as a drop in the labor force if they're not physically looking for a job. There is noise in this estimate, but that is the first negative signal we've seen in some time. Now, across the board, looking at aggregate data, we're seeing generalized pretty stable numbers across the big sectors, though. And um, it's likely, you know, even trade, transportation, and utilities, you know, itself arguably, um, you know, uh, uh, it is the second biggest sector in the Bay Area by employment, one of the greatest GDP generators, um, and uh, and they have three. They added seven thousand employees, and that's an incredible, incredible sum. And so uh, the Bay Area is taking control and is able, I think, um, to to leverage its benefit as a transportation hub uh, globally, especially across the Pacific uh, in, in neighboring economies. Um, so Albert says, can you speak? Uh, to what these crazy layoffs will do to H-1B talent. Oh my God, yes. One well, of the loss of these workers, some of which need to have bat, <laughs> head, head back to their home countries due to us. Albert, you're absolutely right. So I want to reiterate, I don't know, Albert makes a very good point here. So I spend, I spent a lot of time writing very long, very specific letters. Um, one of the things I do is I write them for students, other people, uh, not even at my university, but at other universities that are looking for um, H-1B visas, other things, other forms of, of immigration-based controls. And I justify the unique uniqueness and importance of their job character here. It is very hard and it breaks my heart every time I see someone of incredible talent, be it a student of mine or a colleague student or someone else's that I'm, I'm, I'm engaging with, uh, lose their job and then go back to their own country. I've lost GAs uh, 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 to their respective countries, people who are just brilliant people um, as individuals. And, and one of the true benefits are is, is how difficult the system is and how much effort we should expend to, and I, I'm, you know, I, I don't often get political, but I will say that regardless of your political theory, um, the economics are, st would strongly back a improved immigration system. And each one of these costs that we get, a lost person, an individual, that's a lost family, that's lost productivity, that's a lost element, uh, and, and the United States loses an aggregate. When we lose that abroad, and, and that makes me that makes me a little sad. And I know you're like, well, you know, you're you're competing in one of the most tightest labor markets, the most competitive labor markets in, in the world. But it's all net good. I mean, that's the same way. Academia is the same way. Like I'm the only let's think I'm the only American born member of my department, and uh, and 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 that's wonderful. And it's wonderful because it's so competitive and it's so so out there in that way. So Colin says, why companies are sending out an email letter to their companies that basically boil down to it's bad. The last five years are the exception, not the rule, and tighten your belts. <laughs> I like, ooh, that's rough. So Albert uh, says there's a tons of startups that will be capturing funding, AI, cybersecurity, cloud machine learning, and ventures in very practical areas. 
continue to get meaningful funding. Yes, all the while, it's very interesting. We have all of this good news, right? AI advancing on these fronts, or maybe it depends on, on how nefarious you think AI will be. But uh, AI advancing on fronts, you know, fusion at Livermore. You have a lot of things happening that are really, really cool right now. But then you have this sort of, you sort of, you sort of this, this, this elephant in the room. So Colin, uh, I'm in Therage, uh, zero work the machine that presses out your blood for a blood test that produces 300 results in one hour located in my workplace. Wow, that's fun. That's great. That's good. You know, it's really fun <laughs> as you reach the uh, Theranos uh, uh, successor, Colin. Uh, I can't wait for you to uh, to reach huge amounts of success. Um, no, I know, Colin. I'm, I'm reading it. I read everything first, and then I try to. That's really fun. Um, yes, you'll be the Elizabeth Holmes of uh, of Elbert's list. Uh, Aaron says, objectivity, most consumer tech companies have at least 25 to 50% more employees than needed. Enterprise tech, maybe 10 to 20%. Truth is, we overbuilt, you know, and subsidized low rates, yield seeking last 12 years. But Aaron, you know, you're right about that too. But you're also, it is, you overbuilt because the, the growth rates were high too. And, and when every time there's a reckoning economically, that's where you see a shakeout of those growth things. People become tighter, become more careful about the use of funds, and they become, it forces companies into improved operations and capital management if they're, if they're going to survive. You know, the thing that killed a lot of companies and killed the first company I built and other things was working capital, not one, not one I built, actually. That was uh, working capital management. I did have a startup, which was mainly a, um, a we brewed beer. Uh, 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 I think we made just about our money back, but uh, it was very interesting. Um, and then I do, then I did some consulting stuff and other things. But seeing these things happen in this in real time has been phenomenal. Um, Aaron, you're probably right in that arena. I think we're heading back to 2020 staffing levels. That's probably true. Uh, that's a good discussion. So you're going to see some adjustments in these areas. But here's the thing to remember and, and to level the playing field here and all of you who are concerned about this, you have incredible skills. You have skills that will get you jobs across the country in very meaningful ways. And, 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 and I don't want you to underestimate that at all. So from an academic and philosophical level, do you believe layoffs are beneficial or do you think they hurt companies, economies, and people more? This is very interesting. So. Stanford's lay layoffs kills people and they don't cut costs or improve productivity. That's very interesting. Wow. What a great, what a great article. Without going, I will, I will read the entirety of this article, but I'll talk about this. So in the course of time, I, I mean, this is where I get tricky. And I'm not, this is why, even though I, I do do these interviews and things, like I'm not the best guy for this because I have a difficult time not being really, really wordy and loquacious about really complicated topics. And you know. On some level, it benefits companies and consumers if the company operates efficiently. And it's likely because people are imperfect and organizations are imperfect. They're going to build out in ways that are imperfect and they need to correct that. Now, on the other hand, though, you have that overarching question of it's not that layoffs are, but it's the question of, you know, when we look at this, how has the company structured itself in a way where the things that the people value working there are the things that it can, you know, it doesn't have space, it cannot allow or adequately account for people moving and, and transferring laterally within other positions. It can't absorb uh, changes in a way without laying off people. That in itself, regardless of the way you look at it, even if it was well-intended and based on wrong projections, often failures of, of management. And so, you know, you need to you need to get all of this across in the same sense where you have this. And I like that we're, we're living through this uh, uh, this this real time dialogue between, you know, that that ever so present competition between engineers and marketers and all the other people involved. Everybody can add value. And the question is, is how do you add value? And, and value is not merely profit. Value can be transcended in a different way. We can talk about value in terms of value for your employees, value for all of your stakeholders, among some of which are your employees. So I would say broadly, Albert, to, to not get too philosophical, but also get in the too much in the weeds on this, it's important for firms to cultivate a garden of all of their stakeholders, which includes inevitably their employees. And and to treat them in such a way that that it's very very serious, I have lived through different cycles. I've lived through different things, and I will live hopefully through them again. And it's painful. Layoffs are painful. They cause human problems and issues. But at the same time, the nature of the job market has drastically changed. We we reach a level, the expectation of a 
of a 30 year career at one place is, 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 is like, that's an impossible vision for most people. And it's okay. We're, we're more mobile. We're more able, we're more able to switch between jobs and connect with others within them. And so, so the other side of that coin is that while layoffs might happen and it might happen to you, know how competitive you really are in the scope of things, not just regionally, but also nationally and internationally. And, and I hope that provides some comfort because that is true. So State Farm decided to outsource its IT to India, 2,000 jobs lost. Like a good neighbor, downsizing is here. <laughs> oh, man, that's rough. That's a fun. <laughs> I love it. That's good. That's a new jingle. 2,000 jobs lost. Um, cybersecurity is a lot to say about outsourcing IT work. <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see the correlation next year between the job market, economic performance, and suicides, divorces, and crime rate, all of which show a positive relation. That's true. And, and again, this is the interesting thing. The question is, will the market be absorbed in the Bay Area? Probably for most of those jobs. And uh, because this is an incredibly highly skilled workforce, they'll be absorbed in other places. So I guess to end on a positive note, yes, uh, uh, you know, they're coming and will continue to be a problem, but the layoffs are, remember just how competitive you are. And if you're not from the Bay originally and you immigrated there or immigrated from someplace nationally or internationally, just realize, you know, in the broader scope of things, you are very competitive for a lot of jobs across the board. There's someone here. You can start up a new company in New Mexico. <laughs> All right, questions about this. What do you guys have? Um, oh, Aaron says most of the work which are done, pay, uh, most of that work is worth what they will pay now for it. Consumer tech, enterprise tech work is just like it was in 2000 and 2008. Yeah. yeah, that's true. I mean, companies are rational in that sense. You know, we had a lot of onshoring of the question of onshoring and manufacturing has benefited our manufacturing industry. I think regarding IT work and other things, they're offshoring it and eventually AIing uh, uh, as much as they can. Um, and I think what's revolutionizing, we'll see a lot of more increase in AI space. And I think what's going to happen is, you know, this will change a lot of dynamics in the workforce. I think that, um, and to kind of reiterate one of those points about the way we train people and do things, you know, with some respects, we ultimately want AI to at least serve such a help that um, your training is um, might be less fundamentals, let me most, less focused on knowing everything about every piece of how something worked and more about managing um, a pro, uh, an AI that, that actually is able to do that in, in quicker and in real time and managing that effectively. It's easy to imagine um, a veterinarian requiring a great deal of training uh, right now to understand every aspect of uh, the physiological systems of various animals. Um, but it's also also possible with a very smart AI that it adopted, it would, the veterinarian would need less training, but then they'd need more specified training on how to manage the AI uh, to avoid false positives, other things, and to recommend good courses of treatment. And so it, it will not replace in a Malthusian sense a lot of jobs, it will change how those jobs work, I think. So Albert said, if you had one specific advice for unemployed, what would you tell them, especially given how competitive it is or how competitive it is about to be? You're right. You know, you see a lot of people with the same job skills as you right now getting laid off from a large number of tech firms. And you say, how can I compete against this? But stop focusing on a minimal market. Stop focusing on what you think all your resume can only hold. Think broadly. Think broadly about what your resume would do and how it would benefit firms that aren't even on your radar. So let's say you work in IT and you work for a large, you know, large tech company. You've done a lot of things, a lot of complex stuff. You're a hero when it comes down to building security systems on the other end of the board for a company that doesn't have any experience in that field. Um, think broadly and, and, think, and think wildly about where you might take this job for greater experience that is beyond even the specifics of your individual employment. We, we live in a world of, um, and give an example of this, right? We live in a world of specialists, but your specialization doesn't mean you can't quickly adapt to an environment where uh, you can... Um, you know, you might have a very specific programming expertise, but it doesn't mean you can't explore and build or manage generalized, a more generalized system at some other firm or other company. Um, think about this. Information is information, the way you extend it, the way you look at it. You have opportunities in places you can't imagine. So keep looking broad, keep looking big. Yeah, I love the pay range thing too. That's made me chortle, chortle a lot. Netflix, look at this. I love that. I was reading some of these ads. Yeah, 60 to 600. I saw one for like 90 to 800,000. I love it. That's great. 
you can ask for. I'm like, what's your, what's your, what number are you expecting? Well, based on my experience, obviously towards the upper end of your, of your assessment, Aaron says he would focus on knowing and becoming an expert in regulated domain business and vertical set of processes that lead to core value of their business, becoming a BA, Lean Six Sigma, change management. Yeah, that's cool. That's a good, you can do that too. I think Aaron, you're right on that sense. I think if you're looking at um, adding additional qualifications to differentiate yourself, those are good ones. Um, and I also think that, that spreading your experience around, as Albert says, is good. But I think, you know, I've seen this time and time again, people talk themselves into boxes about their expertise, and that's fine. But I think you're broader and more experienced than you realize. And, you know, one thing that's benefited me is non-traditional experience in weird places. That's been good. You know, my first job uh, was a website manager, actually, back in the 90s of a minor league basketball team. Um, and since that time, that skill has, has helped me still. So Albert says, uh, uh, take something for six months, 1.5, six months to 1.5 years. I was be fighting hard for FTE, but this will win out and you'll get the experience you need. Leverage AI for your work, says Colin's got full in. Colin GPT, my prediction is that the fastest person to learn how they can use each AI to 10 times their workflow process will be more hireable. Look at this. <laughs> Lots of advice today from the advice column. I love it. Yeah, make sure finish. Don't please, please don't. If you're in an educational institution, please don't complete your assignments with AI. We lack an appropriate mechanism to assign, advise GPT. Yes. What is the chat GPT answer to these questions? I'm just going to pop these questions into GPT next time you ask them. Are the opportunity? Are my MBA students optimistic about their opportunities upon graduation this year? Not really. Now they know what's coming and that's the problem because they always hope MBAs is, are always, you know, by design, they're always a reset button. We collect the aisle of lost toys, people who went and graduated from a bunch of different careers, worked for a few years and whatever, did things. Now they're getting their MBA again and, and you go to this and they say, you know, what am I going to do with this? And, you know, the job market's still been strong. So our people have been still getting good jobs. But the question is, of course, you know, is this sustainable? And people are a little bit worried. They're a little bit hesitant. And it's playing into a lot of people's uh, natural risk aversion to things. But, um, and that's always a struggle. I struggle with that too. I'm very risk averse. So GPT will jump uh, the shark within 180 days with gross overuse. <laughs> and then there'll be something else though. That's fun. This is, this is what's cool about, what's cool about chat GPT is this is the first time somebody has been like generally amused at the possibilities of what AI could be. And I think the next successors of GPT are coming down the line and they'll continue to impress. <laughs> Will the musical chairs end? A story for another day. <laughs> All right. What do you guys have? Questions? Anything else? In each market, there are winners and losers. Uh, what substitute careers can the losers go into? The U.S. government was hire hiring 87,000 IRS agents, depending on what Congress is doing with that. So, all right. So, again, I mean, this is not, <laughs> you guys, this is a really good question. I mean, this is the thing. Don't talk yourself in a box on this, Albert. I know, I know. You know, this is the thing about this too. Um, is is think about the broadest range of your degree, and and think about the applications of it that extend far beyond it. You might feel you have a specialized expertise, but for me, I mean, I have a, I have a, I have a, my PhD is in finance. I did take a lot of economics classes, but I make most of all my virtually all my consulting work is in economics because the ability to explain something that you happen to apply in a very practical sense. Um, but um, it forms the basis of your field, even though, you know, I'm not, um, I could, you know, I don't have a separate PhD in economics. I can converse well along these topics because of the relationship in it. And taking a, my finance degree, which is very, really a specialized version of applied economics, and extending that in a broad sense and explaining it more basic things is a skill that you can also develop. And so you might have a very specific, very specific angle on things, but you're probably much more marketable in areas that you aren't even considering. And some of those areas, I think you get management experience down the line, you get other things down the line, you start becoming, your resume fills itself out and it's fantastic. Um, what is your outlook on mergers, acquisitions and IPOs this year? M&A is very cyclical. So M&A is cyclical and M&A also depends on um, availability of funds. On one hand, we have a huge amount of money sloshing around in private equity type things. We have billions of dollars, trillions of dollars. Uh, and it's, by 2026, we're on track for 10 trillion, and 10 trillion in PE. On the other hand, M&As are also funded by things like debt, which has gotten more expensive. 
So we have this balance between this huge amount of private sector interest in these privately held firms m and And I think you're going to see some, some, some synergies and activity here. And I think that a downtrend in the economy, we're going to see a lot of those PE firms, a lot of those firms with investments, a lot of those firms who are looking to make their money back to pay off their investors. Uh, I think M&A will become, will become omnipresent there. For the publicly traded firms, which often rely on debt-based or other forms of capital lending, as well as stock-to-stock -stock transactions with depressed stock prices and expensive debt, we're not going to see it the same way. And so I would actually say that for public firms, it's going to be slow. And I think we might see some private firms speed up in response to the recession. So I fully support UC and CSU grad students, TAs. Oh, great, Lucy. Uh, striking and salary increases. It's time to up-level these folks. I agree. A lot of institutions, the financial institutions, including our own at UNM, uh, a lot of these are based off of, um, we have a lot of classes te taught by adjuncts. And if you've been an adjunct before, if you've been an instructor at a, a collegiate institution, it's really hard, hard to do that. Um, uh, it's hard to make a good living that way. It's very, very hard um, because we don't pay them a lot of money. And as a new AI chat GPT earns hype, cybersecurity experts warn about potential malicious uses. <laughs> Ah, oh, good link, Scott. I like it. Malicious uses for AI. Who would have thought? Sean says, mergers, IPOs, and acquisitions with publicly traded firms tend to be late business cycle activity. And I think we are right now, because we've already seen an increase in debt, we're going to see some slowdown up ahead. So that's my IPO by date. Let's see if we can get some numbers here. But it's cyclical across the board. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, Lucy. I appreciate so much for your kind words. Likewise, and good luck to both of your children on their educational adventures. And remember, if they fail out of everything else, there's always the University of New Mexico. Uh, one thing, <laughs> that's my pitch. I'm just kidding. No, we're a good, you know, we're the, we're the Harvard of Bernalillo County, New Mexico. Um, mergers, IPOs, and acquisitions. So if we have M&A, um, let's get some aggregates here. I'll get you some numbers on this. Computer science, Lucy, fantastic. I'm so glad to see. That is excellent choice. M&A due to economic downturns. So let's grab some of them. Yeah, here we go. This is what I'm talking about. Compared to the previous quarter, in quarter three, 2022, deal activity decelerated further. Deal volume fell about 21%. This is KPMG. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, deal volume fell 21% and the deal value... I'm sorry, deal value dropped 72%. Those are those higher interest rates. So that's what we're seeing. We're seeing, we're seeing losses in M&A. Um, in, in the third quarter, only one transaction, top 10 billion. That was Adobe um, taking over Figma for 20 billion. Um, and again, many private equity firms are targeting companies with falling valuations. I need a business turnaround. That's what I thought too. And transactions and special purpose companies continue to dry up. Bam. I answered it correctly, or at least I answered it the same way KPMG did. And they have more people and they're paid more money. <laughs> Great. I just looked up self-confirming things. I'm going to self, self -confirm. Thank you so much. That's so great. Um, we will also have a huge exit cycle by P coming out of this downturn when the credit cycle opens back up. So much cash that will seek yield. Agreed, 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 Aaron. So much cash seeking yield. Uh, KPMG, <laughs> it's a big four AI. Uh, so when the pet pivots and the rents go down slightly, the M&A gold rush will begin anew. That's right. I think when rates go down a bit, you're going to see M&A activity. But we're seeing, I mean, this price is, if you look at a capital stack, when you buy when you buy a company or anything, you look at a, the amount of funds that come from different places, a capital stack, something like that. Um, debt is always a portion of that capital stack. Debt is more expensive. A lot of firms are in a holding pattern. They're waiting to see when they can get the best deal, when the acquisitions might come through. Um, so that's why we're, we're kind of in a bit of a holding pattern. So it is temporary, and I think it's completely due to all the macro factors you, you, you discussed, that we discussed today. Oh, thank you so much. Promote myself. That's me. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I can't promote myself to Albert's list. I don't post enough on Twitter, because the problem is I get like buried by trolls, and that's and that's that's fun for a while, and then you don't do it. So I just, I, I, I love my little low, I have low engagement posts, but I appreciate it, Aaron. Thank you for the good, thank you for observing it. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Aaron. I appreciate the follow too. Awesome. Sweet deal. I hope the Fed pivots soon. Maybe Jay Powell's visited by the ghost of Christmas future and keeps rates steady in February. Optimistic thinking. I hope. You think he will? He might. <laughs> Maybe he will. I think it will be, it will be a minor increase, if anything. But I think, you know, the Fed's got a lot of tools in its in its in its docket. Um, so what would have to happen for this? I think. 
You know, I don't know. So if we believe, if I, it depends if you, what do you think Jerome Powell values more? Uh, does he view the full employment as being leveraged to increase rates to reduce inflation in a very bullish way? Or is he looking at numbers like the success that we've seen with non-core services, I'm sorry, core services, uh, uh, um, uh, or service inflation falling, excluding things like shelter in ways that show that policy is working and therefore he can ease up. That's going to be a debate, and they're going to debate it. They're going to debate it severely. Aaron taking an outward leap, a hundred basis points in twenty twenty three. I know, I know. I like this. Are you? Are, are you? Are just investing heavily in short term? <laughs> Got a bunch of he's sitting on a bunch of uh, 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 short term investments here. I'm thinking about this this way because that's always the interesting thing. You can buy if you ladder your bond ladder structure in such a way to maximize this. You know, you know it makes it very attractive. If you one of the things you look in the bond market particularly is if you buy a fixed income security um, and you're holding that and rates go up, you know the value of that bond declines. But in the meantime, if you buy it when rates are high and then rates decline, the value of that bond goes up substantially. And so a lot of people might be making some strategic bond market moves, I suspect, this year. Uh, j Pal seems like the kind of guy who might bore you at a dinner party. He nurses drink. He talks to you about aggregate demand. I love that, Albert. And quantitative easing, and it would sound like a foreign language. Oh, he's good. I think he relies heavily. The, the, the political fact is very fascinating. Once they brought in uh, one of the uh, uh, the number two of a regional Federal Reserve chair uh, uh, to speak. Uh, and uh um, you know, the Fed is divided into these, these districts, uh, 12 districts across the country that were based on the old uh, borders of where people lived and people worked back in uh, when the Fed was invented in, the, in 1912, 1913. And um, they um, and this 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 Fed vice chair came in and uh, uh, was basically like, um, you know, you know, he's like the, 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 the chair. They they just sleep through all of my meetings. And, he, you know, he, he's trying to advise you know, this person on, you know, economic policy, what to do in response to rate changes, and this regional chair who sits on the committee that informs and makes a decision and votes with Jerome Powell uh, was asleep through them. So I don't, you know, some of me, I'm a little bit cynical regarding uh, the full ability of everybody to make necessarily the right decision. Aaron says, my T-bills, to be honest, have been kicking ass. I know, haven't they been? You're absolutely right, Aaron. That's absolutely true. Albert says, Alan Greenspan or Arthur Laffer would probably make you laugh. Ho <laughs> oh, ho, Arthur Laffer, Laffer curves all the way. He laughed all the way to the bank on that on that economic theory. Uh, but uh, this is great. What else do you guys have? Anything else before I sign off today? I've exceeded your time. Thank you for our 11 boldest attendees who have stayed for this entire time. This was a great session. <laughs> Love the commentary, Colin, in there as yeah. well. Yeah, Albert, the Albert and I were enjoying being in the peanut gallery. <laughs> This is great. I love it. This is great. This has been the funniest series of webinar chats I've engaged with in a very long time. This is classic. All right, let me do the this outro. Um, thank you, Dr. White, and thank you to everyone who stayed for way over our time. Um, this video was recorded and will be put on YouTube and on our YouTube channel soon, hopefully. Um, and for more events, we do have, I think one, I think one, yeah, on, scheduled on our event page, but we do do this every month. So please follow us. I want to say like and subscribe to the YouTube videos. So yeah, like and subscribe to the YouTube videos. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, please feel free to come back next month when we uh, talk about the next reports, CPI, inflation, and whatever has changed in a month because things change fast this time. So I'm going to pause the recording.